office in my home, uh, let me begin by thanking sincerely Morisan for trying very hard uh, to uh, get me to Tokyo and for inviting me. And also, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce the name, Eri Kawada, uh, and also my student Keiko uh, Nishimura for all their efforts on my behalf. I am sincerely sorry that I cannot be there with you today, um, but it is not um, a choice that was left up to me. So, uh, I hope uh, this will work. I often talk to myself, um, but I don't often talk to myself pretending that I'm talking to an audience. Um, so forgive me if I uh, fail occasionally, um, since I can't see any faces or responses. So uh, I'll begin. I want to tell you a story, which like any story, uh, it's about constructing the present and the past in a way that makes visible where we are, how we got here, and hopefully how we might get somewhere better. It is a story about what Hannah Arendt might have called the dark times of the 21st century. Um, and it certainly feels like, at least in that part of the world that I can see and feel, uh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, and now it is easy to slide into feeling like these are the worst of times. And maybe even if you want to be more complex about it, these are also the best of times in some ways. But I think we must constantly remind ourselves that we are not the only generation living in uniquely troubling times and places. That we are not the only generations that feel like we are facing impossible challenges uh, and impossible forces arrayed against us. Anyway, my story begins, since it must begin somewhere, with the so-called European Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries. That Enlightenment, embodying modes of thinking, feeling, living, socializing, etc., is at least a key pivot point in the West, the beginning and foundation for what we might call Euro-modernity, or what I would prefer to call Euro-modernities, and the contradictions that defined its centuries-long histories. Histories that are full of contradictions, that might be figured on the one hand in Raymond Williams' notion of the long revolution toward greater democracy, greater literacy, greater economic prosperity, greater social justice, etc. And on the other hand, figured by Walter Benjamin's observation that there is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. <coughs> Let me say a few words about the Enlightenment as a complex set of definitions and relations amongst a set of philosophical commitments, for example, rationalism, humanism, anthropocentrism, subjectivism, individualism, uh, beliefs in freedom and agency, uh, along with a complex set of philosophical logics including dualism, transcendence, negation, and universalism, and finally a set of political transformations and norms, usually captured under signs like liberalism, democracy, capitalism, the notion of private property, the nation state, etc. The often invisible and for much of Western discourse of the 19th century, the unsayable consequences of 
these enlightenments included colonialism and imperialism, racism, gender and sexual regulations, enormous poverty, and the legitimated violence that often attended these various organizations and expressions of power. These are what Walter Benjamin might have meant by barbarisms. The question is whether the Enlightenment offered any terms with which to confront its own dark side, to consider how the contradictions deep in the heart of Enlightenment thinking defined its political and social limits, its hypocrisies and failures. As the great uh, American black poet Audre Lorde put it in the middle of the 20th century, the question is, can one use the master's tools to tear down the master's house? In the 19th century, some Western theorists, such as Karl Marx, tried by introducing a notion of critique into Enlightenment philosophy. One might also point to Darwin and Freud here. Critique in a Marxist sense need not be read as a logic of truth and falsity, appearance and reality, but as the necessary misrepresentation of reality in social discourse. Necessary because, in fact, discursive descriptions are always partial and inadequate to the complexity of the totality, so that the problem comes when a partial description, for example, a description of the market as a form of distribution and exchange, substitutes itself for a description of the totality. And misrepresentation occurs because that partiality must try to naturalize itself by in specific contextual forms it must take what is given to be the final result. So in Adam Smith, in Marx's critique, in the classic political economist, what is given is the market, and the market becomes the universal totality of economic life. But the contradiction at the heart of the Enlightenment between the long revolution and barbarism becomes a driving, animating force, particularly in the 20th century, as the contradictions become increasingly unavoidable. Different critics, historians, uh, analysts have argued when this might have begun. One might begin it with the First World War and the increasing rationalization of mass anonymous killing to aerial bombing that was introduced. One might begin it with the communist revolution of 1917, with the Great Depression of 1929, with the Second World War and the subsequent uh, discovery of the Holocaust and genocide that took place not only against Jews, but against other populations, both in the West and the East, but also with moments of, if you will, optimism in the anti-colonial struggles that took place beginning in the mid 20th century, and in the anti-racist struggles, and in the anti-war struggles, and in the growth of feminism and other forms of challenge to the existing structures of enlightenment and modern, Euro-modern power. One can see these efforts to, challenge, to think through and beyond Enlightenment thought in the Frankfurt School and in pragmatism, both of whom, both of which, I guess, offered trenchant criticisms of the notion of reason as it existed in Enlightenment and Euro-modern thinking. One can see it in the popularization of psychoanalysis and existentialism in the mid-20th century. One can see it in the early work of Martin Heidegger and his critiques of humanism, representation, and epistemology, his refusal to throw ontology out of the 
realm of philosophy and critical thought. But it's really after the Second World War that things get really interesting. One might start here, or at least I would, with the later Heidegger's anti-universalist efforts to create what one might call a historical or epochal ontology, a philosophy that influenced uh, and shaped Derrida's subsequent development of deconstructive philosophy, a philosophy that dooms itself to failure, and as we shall see later, uh, Foucault's historical genealogies. But for the purposes of what I want to talk about today, I want to talk about a radical critique of the Enlightenment that developed after the Second World War, built on the recovery of a, or construction perhaps, of a new minor history of philosophy, a history of philosophy in the West, in Europe, that, so it was argued, was somehow marginalized, which included figures such as Spinoza, Nietzsche, Bergson, and others. The most famous 20th century philosopher in this attempt was that was the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, who argued for a return to what he called ontology. Now there are three dimensions I want to mention to this return to ontology. First, it had a particular view of enlightenment. It assumed that each of the elements that comprise the enlightenment, each of the philosophical commitments, each of the forms of logic, and each of the political formations was necessary, and each had an invariant guaranteed content. It assumed that the various elements were necessarily related in fixed ways, in some kind of relation of entailment, if not equivalent, so that rationalism entailed uh, freedom, entailed the commitment to subjectivism, entailed the commitment to individualism, et etc. et cetera. Hence, it assumed that the Enlightenment was a singular, stable, and unchanging event which then moved for centuries, defining the West. It is, in fact, what is often referred to as, quote, the Western tradition. And it, because it held such a view, it saw the need to find, if you will, a key to this singular totality, the Enlightenment. And it found that key in the philosophy of Kant. Now, Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher at the end of the 18th and beginning of 19th century, has been read in many different ways. Most commonly, he has been read in, as having reconciled empiricism and rationalism in what, is, he, in what he called his Copernican revolution. That is, he argued that human beings are capable of experiencing and understanding the world only insofar as they have made it. As a result, what followed from this was first a distinction in Kantian philosophy between the phenomenon, the world as human beings construct it and experience it and are capable of knowing it, and what Kant called the noumena, reality in and of itself, outside of human experience. But obviously Kant expelled the noumena, ontology, metaphysics from the realms of science and philosophy and argued that, in a sense, epistemology, the question of knowledge, and phenomenology, the question of experience, were the only possible sources of knowledge in philosophy. Secondly, the consequence of Kant's uh, Copernican revolution was to argue that humanity, which Kant understood on the one hand, modeled on the European white, upper-class, educated male, and on the other hand, as a universal transcendental subject, that humanity is the engineer or architect of the phenomenal world. This dualism between the phenomenon and the noumenon, between the human world and the world in itself, is reproduced in Kantian philosophy and those who followed him 
inside the phenomenal world in the form of the dualism between culture, the human world, and nature, the world outside of humanity. But now, this is nature inside the realm of human experience. This is nature as always and already constructed by humanity. So there's a kind of double dualism. Okay? Now, this, whatever problems this philosophy gives rise to, and we'll talk about them, it also is a major revolution in Western philosophy because one might argue that with this philosophy, Kant introduced the notion of relationality. Kant introduced the notion that the world is always relational. Right? In Kant's terms, through a theory of mediation by which the constructs of the transcendental subject mediate reality in itself to construct the world of human experience. But it is also important to see Kant as attempting to reconcile another classic dualism, that between freedom and determination. Or to put it in contemporary terms, Kant both raises the question of the relate, Kant raises the question, forgive me, uh, of the relation of structure, determination, and agency, freedom. For Kant, structure or determination is the result of the subject as reason, in which now, of course, the determination is self-determination because it is humanity creating its own structure. And on the other hand, agency is seen as the result of the subject, not of reason, but of will. This is the second critique, where the subject is defined as free through an act of self-legislation. That is, the subject legislates its own laws and therefore is free. Now I might add parenthetically that in the end Kant didn't actually succeed in reconciling these two without adding a third term uh, that troubles his entire philosophy, which is that of imagination. Right? Uh, one might now argue that the turn to ontology in uh, especially European, French, uh, and uh, Italian thought after the Second World War, particularly rejects the first Kantian dichotomy, the dichotomy between the phenomenon and the noumenon, largely by rethinking the second Kantian dichotomy, the relationship and difference between structure and agency, between determination and freedom. Now there is a second dimension to this turn to ontology, and again, we can start with Kant. For yet another way of reading Kant is to suggest that Kant was asking what reality must be like if one assumed that Newtonian physics was right. Which is fine, except that, of course, since the second half of the 19th century, physics has largely been an argument that we do not live in a Newtonian universe a universe that is stable and predictable according to law-like calculations. Starting with the discovery of the laws of thermodynamics, which redefined the relation of matter and energy and therefore the nature of the material world, and which saw the universe not in terms of stable structure, but of entropic chaos. That is, the world is losing its structure. And continuing through in the late 19th and early 20th century, the discoveries of relativity and quantum theory, and as the century goes on, cybernetics and information theory, it is the case that we live in a very different universe than Newton had postulated. And one might argue that contemporary ontologies uh, have attempted to ask, what must the universe be like in philosophical terms if these new physics are true? Uh, parenthetically, one might well ask what happens to these new ontologies if and when one discovers that the stochastic probabilistic universe that we now assume we live in, however strange it may be, is proven to be wrong, as Newton was proven to be wrong. 
Anyway, what has emerged are a whole series of philosophical ontologies, most influentially that of, as I said, Deleuze. Deleuze sees a universe made up of, if you will, quanta of energy or force. Lines of becoming, he calls them, intensities, defined not by their difference from one another, not defined by negation, but each defined positively as the capacity each quanta of energy has to affect change in other quanta and to be in turn affected by the capacities of those quanta. That is, the universe is defined by, if you will, elements that exist only as the possible production of change. And thus change, or what Deleuze calls becoming, is more fundamental than structure or stability. This is what Deleuze describes as a monism of multiplicities and as a philosophy of imminence, because as opposed to transcendence, where something is greater than and supersedes all other things, be it God or the law or what have you or the subject, because it is imminent because in Deleuzean philosophy, everything that exists ultimately exists in just the same way, that is, as quanta of change or becoming, forces, lines of change. The universe then, this universe of possible effects and changes, is made actual through the production of relations that activate, actualize, or enable specific capacities of specific quanta by putting specific lines of becoming or specific elements. You think of this in terms of quantum physics, if you will, as a kind of almost literal metaphor. Uh, when different quanta meet, they have different effects, uh, different relations amongst the different quantum particles have produce uh, greater totalities and greater effects, right? And in these relations that produce particular effects through enabling particular capacities for change, then we begin to produce more and more uh, complex and larger organizations or structures which come to define particular actualities, particular universe. That is, the Deleuzean world is a universe in which agency the power to produce reality and to change it does not belong particularly to humans, but is the result of what Deleuze calls in order to get away from the kind of humanism of Kant and the Enlightenment, what Deleuze calls machines. And machines are only defined by the kinds of relationships they produce. A coding machine produces particular kinds of code. A territorializing machine produces particular distributions of the quanta. Uh, a particular machine of capture selects out a group of quanta out of the totality. These machines exist, but for every machine, its opposite exists. So every coding machine has a decoding machine, and both the coding and the decoding machine, both the territorializing and the deterritorializing machine, the capturing and the decapturing machine, uh, all of them succeed and fail to different degrees at different times and places. Now, I actually like this philosophy. And for those of you who may have had the unfortunate uh, experience of having had to read some of my writing, uh, you will know that I have tried over a series of almost 40 years now to engage with Deleuzean philosophy and to integrate it, to use it uh, in formulating my own version of cultural studies. So my argument is not with the philosophy. What I want to talk to you today is uh, about the ways in which this uh, onto these ontolo ontological philosophies, in particular Deleuzean philosophy, uh, has been taken up in the human sciences. 
uh, has been uh, to form what is called in the U.S. Academy uh, the ontological turn. And I want to make some brief critical observations, uh, places where I think that this ontological turn leads to problems, if not dead ends. Uh, uh, and I want to start with what is, for me, it's most troubling, which is the common association of this ontological turn with the dismissal of the possibility, value, and politics of what is generally called critique or critical thinking, in which I locate not only Marx, but also cultural studies, where critique is assumed increasingly by the, within the ontological term, to be paranoid, elitist, complicitous with power. It is part of the old guard that has to be thrown out along with the new, uh, in favor of the new. So that the answer to Audre Lorde's question uh, is immediately and absolutely no. The master's tools cannot be used. One, let me just give you some brief, uh, quick examples of this. One, a very influential and notorious article by the French sociologist of science turned philosopher Bruno Latour in an essay called Why Has Critique Run Out of Steam? Uh, he describes critique as, quote, critical barbarity. And he says it is, quote, predicated on the discovery of a true world of realities lying behind a veil of appearances. Right? A true world of realities lying behind a veil of appearances. It, again, quote, lifts the rugs from under the feet of naive believers, unquote. So it's about debunking defetishizing, deconstructing the ordinary everyday assumptions with which people approach reality, their lived lives, and power. His examples, however, are generally quite extreme, mostly conspiracies. So, for example, he cites uh, Jean Baudrillard's claim that the uh, um, attacks of 9-11 on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon never happened or at least that it was the result of a U.S.-Israeli conspiracy. Now, to my mind, that's not a very good argument. I mean, if most of us would probably not embrace conspiracy theories such as that. But then he goes on to say, what's the real difference between conspiracists and a popularized, that is, a teachable version of social critique inspired by a too-quick reading of, let's say, a sociologist as eminent as Pierre Bourdieu. So, I gather, critique has run out of steam because there are too many conspiracy theorists and too many bad social critics who don't know how to read Pierre Bourdieu. But what about Pierre Bourdieu? And what about all those social critics who do know how to read Pierre Bourdieu? But Latour dismisses them by saying that 90% of the work in critical human sciences is composed of such bad, paranoid readings. Now, a second example is the work of Timothy Morton, um, who is a slightly, not a Deleuzian, but a different kind of ontologist, who argues um, that, in fact, uh, this critical attitude, and I quote now, is directly responsible for the ecological emergence. Not the corporation or the individual per se, but the attitude that inheres both in the corporation and in the individual and in the critiques of corporations and individuals today so that apparently those of us who practice a kind of critique are responsible for the environmental crisis that we face. And one final example is uh, the now recently celebrated uh, Jasper Poir in a book called Terrorist Assemblages, where she argues that the temporality of scholarly work is itself complicitous with modern power. She talks, she says, and I quote, 
How then do we reassess the valuation of scholarly production emergent from apparent notions of stability, longevity, and depth? Such a rethinking of the assumed shapes and temporalities of the labor of thinking and writing contributes to a broader global vision that does not erase profoundly uneven materialities of production in the world. So apparently, because those of us who believe in critical work take, believe it has to be done carefully, rigorously, and to some extent slowly, we are unable to challenge the inequalities of the world. Now, the second point I want to raise about these ontologies is to raise some questions for thought, if you will, points of inconsistency. I don't have time to dwell on them. I'm trying to write them up myself as perhaps my, the last book I will write. For while the new ontologies, the, the, the ontological turn often based in Deleuze, while it rejects the binary logic of Kant, noumena, phenomena, culture, nature, it is actually quite selective in how it does it. And as a result, it is consistently setting up its own dualisms. It in fact looks a lot like a kind of postmodern logic of good and bad concepts of old history and new history. Just to use one very philosophical example, I would say you know, it starts with the distinction between transcendence, uh, which it sees uh, enlightenment philosophy and thinking and Western rational thinking uh, embodying, and imminence. But it doesn't avoid the binarism of transcendence and imminence. It in sa instead says Imminence is more ontologically fundamental than transcendence, and transcendence then becomes an act of power over and against imminence that has to be resisted. The alternative would be to reject the very binary distinction and to suggest that the kind of relationships suggested or tried, uh, diagrammed in notions both of imminence and transcendence uh, have to be seen as multiplicities, not as a choice between two, but uh, as a multiplicity of variety of ways in which various concepts, various realities, and various practices may relate to one another. The result of buying into the couplet of transcendence and imminence is that the attempt in Deleuze, largely successful in some sense, to find what one might call a naturalist philosophy, which says, following the pragmatists or Spinoza, if you will, that whatever is experienced to exist does exist. Experience has to be put in brackets because it is not subjective or even necessarily human, but whatever is experienced to exist does exist, no more and no less. That is, there is a form of reduction which denies that that which exists actually exists, and there is a form of reduction which adds things to it. The Western form of reduction is largely to suggest that there are other things that we cannot experience that exist, such as the transcendental subject, but in fact, I want to suggest that the ontological turn makes the opposite mistake by suggesting that there's less in the world that the, that, than what exists. So that we end up with a kind of reductionism that denies the reality of some events, except uh, as assertions of power over and against the fundamental nature of reality. Similarly, what starts off as a critique of Enlightenment universalism ends up with a new ontological university, universalism. What starts off as a reasonable critique against the claim that discourse is always representation ends up rejecting the very possibility of representation as anything other than an expression of power. Although one might want to ask, what their own work is doing, if not representing the world. 
what starts off by rejecting critique and often ends up offering diagnoses of what's going on based on a leap from abstract concepts to socio-historical realities. Thus, one might well want to ask, for example, Latour, why the discovery of actor networks theory, actor networks, below, as it were, the experienced reality, is any less of a critique than the things he dismisses. Right? But this ontological work in the human sciences moves often from philosophical concepts like preemption or incipience, right? or imminence to claims to be describing socio-historical realities in which the very complexity, the very structures of relationalities and mediations that link the abstract concept to the concrete realities is lost. What starts off as an attempt to expand the boundaries of agency beyond the human ends up often abandoning the specific forms of agencies of the human. And this leads me to one final dimension, to the emergence of ontology and the ontological term. In one sense, all of them, as I've suggested, are asking Audre Lorde's question. But I want to suggest that, they, that the ontological turn in philosophy was shaped by a very particular context. My context is described brilliantly and beautifully, I think, by the French philosopher Michel Serre, who was born in 1930 and is part of the generation that would include Deleuze, Derrida, Foucault, Lacan, etc., etc. People born in the between years of the First and Second World Wars in Europe. And Serre writes, my generation lived through these early years very painfully. The preceding generation was 20 years old at the beginning of the events and as adults lived them in an active way, becoming involved in them. My generation could only follow them in the passivity of powerlessness as children, adolescent, in any case weak and without any possibility of action. Violence, death, blood and tears, hunger and bombings, deportations affected my age group and traumatized it, since these horrors took place during the time of our formation, physical and emotional. My youth goes from Guernica, parenthesis, he says, I cannot bear to look at Picasso's famous painting, by the way, one of my all-time favorite paintings. My youth goes from Guernica to Nagasaki by way of Auschwitz. My generation was formed physically in this atrocious environment and ever since has kept its distance from politics. For us, power still means only cadavers and tortures. I want then to suggest that in some way, the ontological turn is as much an expression of the disappearance or death of politics as it has been understood from Socrates to European modernities. It is an expression of what the fascist German philosopher Karl Schmitt called the absence of the nomos of the earth after World War II which we are witnessing increasingly day by day in the United States and recently in England in the dissolution of a century long demarcation separating what we colloquially call the right and the left, conservatism and progressivism, and the increasing, if you will, depolitization of generations. What we are left with is a series from the new ontological turn of what I would describe as ethical figures. I don't mean to deride the importance of ethics. Ethics is absolutely necessary for politics, but it is not equivalent to politics. What one finds in the new ontological work in the human sciences are politics built on images of creativity, excuse me, of multiplicity, deterritorialization, becoming, 
the pluriverse. Images of creativity, experimentation, autopoiesis, or self-production. Images of love, making, composition, and helping to increase capacity. Images of radical democracy, prefiguration, and insurgency. It seems to me these are all ways of avoiding politics in the desire for a philosophy that is immediately and necessarily political, precisely as pure speculation, without any link, without any necessary responsibility to the concrete empirical world of power. In its place and in conclusion, I want to return to the Enlightenment and to see it not as a singular fixed totality, but an open and changing and contested field of possibilities. To see that the terms, concepts, logics, and politics often seen in the Enlightenment can be extricated from one set of relations and put in another, so that the terms may vary, their meanings may vary, and the relations amongst them may vary, so that there is not one, but many actual and possible Enlightenments, and hence, many actual and possible modernities. And thus, I want to return to the possibility of critique, not as a search for the right theory, but as a changing complex set of practices and concepts aimed at understanding what's going on in order to find ways to make the world better. It is what Eve Sedgwick uh, called the accountability of the real. It is but Michel Foucault, rereading Kant's essay, uh, What is Enlightenment, extracts from Enlightenment to defend. As he says, the question of today is what is our actuality? What is the present reality? What is happening today? Because only then can we ask about the field of possible experience. Only then can we know the mode of action capable of transforming the present. And he continues, this implies a sense of historical inquiry that is as precise as possible, not a gesture of rejection. We need to separate out from the contingency that has made us what we are, the possibility of no longer being, doing, or thinking as we do. And this, for me, is the project of cultural studies as critique. How do you think otherwise? without giving up the recognition of the need to understand reality in all its complexity, as that which grounds, both limits and enables the possibilities of living otherwise. How do you give new meaning and vitality to Marx's notion that people make history, but not in conditions of their own making, but also by recognizing that they make history never by themselves, always in relations to the multiple operations and levels of material, organic existence. How do you recognize that other worlds are possible, but to get to them, we need to understand how one is grounded materially, socially, technologically, historically, geographically, organically in the current world that we live in. Thank you very much. I wish I were there with you. That's all.